Okay, hello everyone, and uh, welcome back once again to the Pineland Speaker Series. Uh, we're very fortunate today to have with us once again, uh, Jennifer Balava. Uh, Jen is the lead naturalist with the Burlington County uh, Park System. And she's gonna continue her uh, series on uh, communication in nature. Uh, and today she's gonna spotlight uh, plants. So with that, I'm gonna turn the program over to Jen. Thank you, Joel. In parts one and two of this nature and communication series, I talked about how animals communicate with one another using a variety of methods, including visual, sound, and chemical cues. Obviously plants do not have anything like that. They're extremely different. They don't have ears, eyes, brain, or nervous system. So the ways that they communicate are much less obvious than those of animals, but I think all the more intriguing. And so this presentation is all about how plants communicate with one another. So I'm going to uh, just turn off my video so it doesn't obscure the slides. And um, I hope you enjoy it. First, I just wanted to mention that uh, obviously plants communicate or signal to animals they depend upon for pollination and seed dispersal. And they can do that using scent, color, and different shapes of flowers to attract certain kinds of pollinators. If you um, have seen my Secret World of Plants and Pollinators, I talk about this in detail. You can see in these examples um, that this particular aster is very efficient at targeting pollinators like bees, whereas an evening primrose that is pale and blooms in the evening is, is targeting a moth. And this uh, coral honeysuckle is bright red, has no scent and a long tubed sh tubular shape for attracting hummingbirds. In the image in the top right, you see black-eyed Susan and uh, certain flowers such as this species also have hidden ultraviolet patterns that they can use to target certain pollinators that can see in the ultraviolet spectrum. And in the secret world of plants and pollinators, I show this as well. And this is just an example um, showing here the ultraviolet hidden patterns that the black-eyed Susan has for attracting insects such as bees. So obviously, Plants can also use the scent, color, and certain types of shaped fruits and seeds to also attract the seed dispersers that they need uh, as well. So, as I said, for this particular presentation focuses on how plants communicate with other plants. And plants cannot communicate with other plants with body language or sound like animals do, but they can communicate using chemical sense, compounds that can be released into the air or via underground networks. Leafy plants release a number of volatile organic compounds known as green leaf volatiles or GLVs when the plants are injured in some way. It could be as a result of animals grazing on them damaged by insects, infections, or even mechanical forces like mowing. The green leaf volatiles, those compounds stimulate the formation of new cells at the wound site so it closes faster. And some of the compounds actually act as an antibiotic that prevents bacterial infection and inhibits fungal growth. And some compounds spur the production of defensive compounds at unwounded sites as a sort of preemptive fortification. So if the damage to the leaf is caused by an herbivore, the plant will pump toxins into the unwounded leaves to make them bitter or inedible. So for instance, when a caterpillar takes a bite out of an oak leaf, the tissue around the damaged site changes. Oaks carry tannins, which are bitter compounds, 
and they can sometimes kill a chewing insect outright, but mostly affects the leaf's taste to the point that they become horribly bitter and the caterpillar moves on. And then there are still other compounds that react with other chemicals to act as a distress signal. These distress signals can be sent via the green leaf volatiles on the wind or through the soil. And when we mow grass, we're smelling, we're detecting those green leaf volatiles that are released by the cut wounded blades of grass. So there are two kinds, major kinds of chemical cues for communication among plants. Pheromones are chemical compounds that are carried to a member of the same species. We talked about this a lot in the animal communication series. This, in this case, so the information is being carried to the same, same species of plant, which can be used as a warning. The other type of chemical cue are known as allelial chemicals. And these are chemical compounds that are carried to a different species. So in the case of plants, that would normally be a signal to an animal that could be either defensive repellent or an odor to attract a beneficial insect to kill the pest. So we're gonna look at examples of both of these. First, uh, pheromones can be given off via the wind to warn neighboring trees or other plants. And one of the best examples has been shown with giraffes and acacia trees in Africa. To, to deter herbivores like the giraffes, acacias will start pumping toxic substances into their leaves to get the giraffes to move away. The acacias will give off the warning pheromone in the air, signaling to the neighboring acacia trees that these animals are are harming the leaves. So then the uh, acacias basically are become too bitter and the giraffes will have to move. The giraffes, however, have figured out that they need to move at least a hundred yards away or move upwind to get to leaves that did not receive the alarm message. So allelo chemicals, as we said, are also very effective. So in addition to warning other plants and mounting their own defense, plants can also use scent compounds to call for help. Since the saliva of each insect species is different, trees can identify which pest is attacking it. A tree can then broadcast alarms that summon specific beneficial predators to eat the pests. This is just Absolutely amazing. This is an example of oleochemical communication. And really good examples of this include aphids, which you can see are major pests, and they would call in ladybugs to eat them. And uh, another example with catalpa sphinx moth caterpillars eating catalpa leaves. You can see on the right that that catalpa sphinx moth has been parasitized by the wasp that the catalpa tree had summoned to, um, to uh, parasitize the caterpillars. There are actually some other above ground defenses that are worth mentioning and only recently discovered. In our area of the Pinelands, we see a parasitic vine known as daughter. Parasitic plants, with these have no roots or chlorophyll. So they steal water and nutrients from their hosts using special organs that basically um, function similar to a root to tap into the host plant's stems. Normally, this would not be a good thing for a plant. However, daughter vines connect different host plants together, forming an above ground network. If any plant in that connected network is attacked by an herbivore, 
defense signals are transferred via these dotted bridges to neighboring plants making the unattacked plants more resistant to enemies. And they can do this by activating defense genes and expressing them in the unattacked neighboring plants. So it's pretty, it's pretty amazing all the defenses that plants have for um, protecting against major uh, infestations. So now we're gonna look at underground defenses. Dr. Suzanne Samard's research, she has really been a, a fantastic pioneer in this field. She's a professor of forest ecology at the University of British Columbia. And her research in this field of plant communication has shown that chemical signals and electrical impulses are sent through underground fungal networks also known as mycorrhizae. And these mycorrhizal networks function like fiber optic internet cables, helping trees exchange information and resources, coining the term wood wide web. Her research discovered that trees are cooperating instead of competing. Her work has influenced filmmakers such as James Cameron's Avatar and The Tree of Souls. And her TED Talks have been viewed by more than 10 million people worldwide. So I'm gonna talk lots more about that, but first we have to define some terms of fungi, the structures that we see inside a fungus, such as a, a mushroom, the one term we have for the th fungal threads are hyphae or hyphae, plural. And the mycelium is si simply a network of all the, the hyphae together. And this is what we consider the body of a fungus. Remember that uh, fungi are consumers, not producers like plants. So the mycelium is typically hidden in a substrate such as underground or in a dead log and they secrete enzymes for digesting organic matter. The fruiting body is simply the reproductive structure that we often see above ground, in this case, a mushroom, and it contains the spores, which is how they reproduce. So the mycorrhizae is the association of vascular plant roots connecting with this mycelium underground. So together they form a bridge known as mycorrhizae. And that literally means fungus root because myco is the prefix for fungi and rhizae is the, fun is the prefix for root. So this literally means fungus root working as one. So the, there are three main types of fungi, parasitic, uh, saprophytic, and mycorrhizal. And it turns out that about 90% of plants live in some association with mycorrhizal fungi. Some mycorrhizae will penetrate the root cells of the plant, while others form a fungal sheath around the plant roots. And the fungi will colonize the root system of the plant, providing increased water and nutrients while the plant provides carbohydrates to the fungi. As I said, they can't make their own food. In general, a higher mycorrhizal fungal diversity equals a higher plant diversity. So let's look at this symbiotic relationship a little closer. So here we see the pathway for the transfer of nutrients and water and other substances between the fungus and the plant. The benefits to the fungus or that it gets up to a third of the tree's sugars from photosynthesis. And of course, the benefits to the plant include a lot of increased nutrient uptake, especially nitrogen and phosphorus. You could find twice the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus in plants that have a fungal partner. You can see a lot of increased water uptake as well as the sequestration of heavy metals, improved soil structure, deterrence of herbivores, and 
overall better tolerance to environmental stresses in the forest. So we're gonna look at this again uh, in, in more detail. Through the mycorrhizal network, you could see that trees are connected to each other and nutrients and water can flow very efficiently among all the plants. And the, let's, if we call it a, uh, a, a mature tree, can send its uh, nutrients and water from itself to its offspring or seedlings. Because plants can distinguish between their own roots, the roots of related individuals and roots of other species, the nutrients can flow from a parent to a seedling and increase the survival rate of their own seedlings by up to four times as much. Through sharing and efficiently dividing nutrients and water among all plants in the, in the forest, you can actually, you can see how this can increase the resilience of the forest to future stresses. In an undisturbed forest, the rate of photosynthesis is the same for all the trees. An evergreen can share extra carbon with a deciduous tree when it's leafless in the winter. And then a deciduous tree can share its extra carbon in the summer. The uh, image below shows a clip from Suzanne Samard's TED Talk in, in again, illustrating how carbon moves from a parent to a, an offspring through the mycorrhizal network. I highly recommend watching her TED talk, how trees talk to each other. So mycorrhizal networks can transport signals produced by plants in response to an infestation to neighboring plants. And they can do this in three different ways. Some chemical com compounds can be transported in liquid form on the external surface of the hyphae via capillary action, and, but that's only over very short distances. Some compounds can be transferred within the hyphae and passing from the fungus to the plant cells themselves. And then third, I'm sorry, Third, electrical signals can also be produced in response to plant damage. Electrical signals are a result of a process known as depolarization, during which a cell undergoes a shift in electrical charge distribution. It results in less negative charge inside the cell compared to outside. Electrical impulses travel at a third of an inch per second. While that sounds very slow, this is still a lot faster than the movement of a molecule through cells, which occurs significantly slower. So using all these mess messages and transporting information through the underground network, it can actually target specific plants compared to aerial communication, which is broad scale and isn't dependent on wind strength and direction. I did want to mention that the mustard or brassicaceae family is non-mycorrhizal. So they do not participate in the sharing of nutrients and information. And in fact, they can inhibit um, the, that, that symbiotic relationship. Garlic mustard actually suppresses mycorrhizal fungi with antifungal chemicals. So not only is it a nasty invasive plant that outcompetes our native plants, it also um, messes up this cooperative network. One thing that may be uh, useful to know is a lot of our crops, a lot of our vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, kale, et cetera, are in the mustard family. And so if you're growing these in your garden, you would wanna put these together, but not mixed with non-mustard plants. I also wanted to mention that beets and spinach, which are non, not mustards, are also non-mycorrhizal. 
most plants are going to be using a combination of both aerial and underground defenses to effectively communicate, especially when there is some kind of uh, infestation or enemies that need to be repelled. And one of the best ways of visualizing this, I think, is to watch this fantastic animation that is seen in Ava Sky Barton's Can Trees Communicate YouTube video. Her video is just under three minutes, but shows amazing examples of the things we just talked about. Here, I'm just going to show you a very short clip of how, uh, that demonstrates how plants can use a combination of aerial and underground defenses. So we now know that mycorrhizal networks aid in sharing resources and helping seedlings, but plants also use a technique called allelopathy, which is when a chemical signal is sent through the mycorrhizal network. This allows plants to warn each other of impending threats. A study conducted on bean plants found that after a plant had been infested with aphids, it sent a warning signal through the mycorrhizal network to a plant nearby, which thereafter released a chemical signal that attracted the aphid's predator, the parasitic wasp. So hopefully that visual amazing animation helps, helps to understand this incredible process. Masting is a, the synchronized production of large crops of seeds by trees that grow in the same area. It's an adaptive strategy for trees to enhance seed survival. Masting occurs in long lived large seeded trees like oaks, beeches, hickories, and walnuts. These are wind pollinated trees. It can also occur in uh, some of our coniferous trees like pines. Thin rings in mast years give evidence of a drain on a tree's resources during a mast year. Therefore, trees are unlikely to have two mast years in a row. Mass producing trees have a love-hate relationship with wildlife. They have to rely on birds and mammals to disperse their seeds, but can suffer too much if many of those seeds are eaten or destroyed. An example with acorns shows that while mammals and birds help spread them far and wide, acorns are such a valuable food resource that most of them never get to sprout. In the two years that it takes a red oak acorn to develop and mature on a tree, about 50% of them are parasitized, are eaten or otherwise destroyed. Once they fall to the ground, about 98% of them succumb to a similar fate and are mostly eaten by animals. So instead of producing mast, you can see that this, this strategy is to um, basically starve the seed predators in other years and then overwhelm them with more than they could possibly eat at once. And instead of producing mast every year, they produce it at irregular intervals withholding production, as I said, for several years, and then producing a massive abundance of seed. This results in lowering the seed eating um, predators populations. And then the intervals at which these mast years occur varies by different species. So it depends upon the species themselves. And also, most importantly, the weather prior to the flowering of the tree. Harsh winters or springtime freezing can lead to little acorn production or none at all. It has nothing to do with the winter that's coming up. That's a very common misconception. So the winter of 2021 was mild and that meant good conditions for flowering. So in the fall of 2021, we had a lot of acorns and nuts specifically it was a masting year for chestnut oak, beech, black walnut, and many hickories. Warm, dry springs, spring when buds first develop, means that more flowers grow and therefore more seeds can potentially be produced. Wet summers the following year when seeds mature 
a key for a successful mast year. And then the individual, as I said, it depends upon the individual type of tree and the availability of nutrients and water. Overall, the advantages to the tree are that more seeds survive and germinate through this masting process. And seed, pre seed predators are satiated so that many of their seeds again survive and germinate. The fertile seeds are only half as likely to be consumed by the seed eaters in a mast year. If there are more seeds than normal, seed predators may disperse and cache seeds at a greater distance, leaving more offspring and more efficiently dispersed. And when synchronized flowering occurs, pollination is enhanced, especially for these wind pollinated trees like oaks and beaches. It also means that more individual tree genes can mix. The key to this strategy is coordination. It only works if the same tree species mast all at once. How these trees coordinate mast years is still quite a mystery, but it's likely that as a combination of chemical signals pass through the air or through underground mycorrhizal connections, as well as weather cues. In some parts of the world, mass coordination between trees of a given species may stretch for hundreds and even thousands of miles. So in conclusion, why would plants work together to share food among species instead of competing? There are advantages obviously working together just like there are in with, with humans. If every tree were just looking out for itself, many trees would not make it to old age. Regular dying of trees in the forest results would result in large gaps in the canopy, which makes it easier for storms to uproot more trees. Too much sunlight in the woods dries out the forest floor. Many trees together create an ecosystem that moderates extremes of hot and cold. They store a lot of water and they generate humidity. They can obviously share information and warnings on the wind with one another and also share water, nutrients, and information through those underground mycorrhizal networks. Fungi help trees transmit information and also increase the roots surface area so that they can get more water and nutrients from the soil. The underground connections make the forest one connected unit. So the association with mycorrhizae and plants, as I said, leads to better root formation and less and fewer root diseases, soil pest problems. What can you do to help ensure that this amazing communication keeps continuing? En encourage beneficial insects by using less or no pesticide in your yard. Encourage the mycorrhizal networks by leaving the soil as undisturbed as possible. Add compost on top of the soil and let it decay naturally instead of mixing it. And lastly, allow our living trees to grow. If we take out too many of those really important hub trees, the whole network is messed up and broken. As John Muir said, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. There's a perfect analogy for this incredible, these incredible means of how plants communicate through both the air and through these amazing underground networks. These are some recommended sources of information. I highly recommend these two YouTube videos. Obviously, Suzanne Samard's How Trees Talk to Each Other, the TED Talk. And I also provided the link to Ava Barton's Can Trees Communicate? As I said, it's a fantastic animation summarizing a lot of the points that I talked about here. 
in just under three minutes. So I'm going to uh, switch over, see if there are any uh, questions out there. And this is the call in number. Just make sure to mute your computer if you're calling in. Awesome, Jay, that's really cool. It's so neat to see those interconnections. You know, nature is so interconnected, just like you said, everything is part of everything else. Uh, it's really cool uh, the way you were able to illustrate and show that that video was pretty interesting too, that uh, little cartoon, um, pretty neat. Thank you. Yeah, you know, sometimes we go about our daily lives, we're in a rush and we just don't think about or we take for granted all the interconnected things that are going on uh, in nature without us not even knowing about it. Yes, absolutely. And that's really the point of this particular, this whole series, communication in nature is to kind of give people an appreciation for just how much is going on all around them every day uh, in, in just incredible ways. And I, I really, uh, I really think that this particular topic of plant communication is, 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 is really fascinating. Yeah, I, you know, I, I spend a lot of time in the woods and I always try to figure out the acorns. You know, why are there so many acorns this year? Why aren't the acorns there at this spot? And it all makes sense. They're all, they're communicating, they're working together. Uh, it, that is a perfect, uh, you know, it shows just how that all works. Mm -hmm. uh, while we're waiting for anyone to call in, I'll just say that uh, coming up next month, we're going to have our Pineland Summer Short Course. It's going to be uh, at Stockton's Cramer Hall facility or campus, which is out in Hamilton, New Jersey. And it's gonna be on July 21st, which is a Thursday. Uh, we're gonna have a mix of uh, classroom and field programs. So if you wanna learn more about the Pinelands, especially if you're up for a field trip, uh, you know you can find the information on our website and uh, through Stockton University's Continuing Studies uh, website. Um, and uh, coming um, at the end of this month, we'll open registration and uh, it's going to be July 21st, the summer Pineland short course. I think it's going to be our sixth summer uh, short course uh, this coming year. I'd like to thank everyone out there for watching and, uh, and I hope that this particular information in inspires you to uh, take a, a closer look at nature and certainly a better appreciation for the amazing interconnectedness of life. Yep, that's well said, Jen. I mean, we're all part of it. You know, we're all, we're all in this together. Us, the animals, the plants, we're all, we're all one big system. Uh, we certainly, have behaviors that can hurt things. And uh, it's great to encourage things that are gonna help. And so we all, uh, we all survive and we all stay sustainable uh, into the future. All right, on that note, I think we're gonna wrap it up. Uh, we may not have any callers today, but that's okay. Uh, Jen, thank you for your presentations. They've been a great asset. And uh, all these presentations are online uh, on the Pinelands Commission website, but also through our YouTube channel. So uh, all these resources are available for people to learn and uh, better interact and uh, cohabitate with uh, nature around us. Thanks a lot, Jen. You're welcome. All right. See you guys later. See you at the short course. <laughs>